Hi, I'm Willem Dafoe, and this is the timeline of my career. I never really decided I wanted to be an actor. I always kind of thought I'd end up doing something differently, and then enough time passed where I thought, I guess I'm an actor. I've been doing this for a while. I went to school for a little while in an acting program, but I dropped out very quickly. And I was reading about people like the Performance Group, the Manhattan Project, Grotowski, Robert Wilson. So I went to Mecca, which was New York. There was part of me that thought I would try to be a traditional actor, but I kept on finding myself going downtown, going to loft performances, seeing dance. And I got involved with a company called the Wooster Group that I ended up being with for 27 years, and that was my day-to-day -day life. Speak English. He's hurt. My first IMDb credit is Heaven's Gate. But that was a very particular situation. Someone said, you know, they're making this movie, and it's Michael Cimino, and The Deer Hunter came out. I had seen it. I thought it was great. And they're looking for ethnic faces. The audition was you did one monologue in English, and then you did in another language. So I had a friend of mine phonetically write out that speech in Dutch. They just assumed I was fluent in Dutch. So when I got there, Chimino asks me to improvise in a scene, talks me through the whole scene, and he says, okay, and in Dutch. And I'm like, I don't speak Dutch. <laughs> what? <laughs> you don't speak Dutch? <laughs> I was in a lighting setup, and someone told me a joke. Chimino heard me laugh, and he turned around and he said, Willem, step out. And that was it. I was fired from that. So I don't really count that as my first movie. Although, if you look hard enough, you will see me. I'm one of the cockfighters. I fight Jeff Bridges' cock. Don't you think I ought to get out of here while you do that? Relax, ma'am. And crank that radio up. The first movie that I really made that I had a substantial role in was The Loveless. Is that any good? And that's really where it started. Bingo. Catherine Bigelow and Monty Montgomery saw me at the Wooster Group, and they asked me uh, whether I wanted to make a movie. I'm attracted to strong directors, auteur directors, directors that really need to do something. You like to be around those people. They inspire you. They take you to places that you can't go by yourself. And I'm not interested in doing a job. I'm interested in helping an artist do what they need to do. They're behind the camera. They need someone to be their creature. I'm a color in the canvas, and I love that. Okay, ma'am. You're back in action. Platoon was a movie that took a long time to get made. Oliver Stone saw lots of actors because he first just wanted to cast a group of actors and then decide what characters they would play later. He said, yeah, okay, you're, you're going to be in this movie. I don't know which role, which was kind of an interesting approach. I arrived in the Philippines, and my plane was the last plane in because there was a revolution. Sit tight, the movie's canceled, we'll get you out when we can. So for about three or four days, me and a couple of other people that were there ahead of time were out on the streets with the people. <laughs> and it was an incredible feeling because it was a revolution that happened, for the most part, without violence. They got the movie back on track and we made it. The fact that that death scene in Platoon has become iconic, as I was doing it, it felt special, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee it's going to be iconic. All the elements came together, and I was just part of that. When you talk about task-oriented acting, it sounds like maybe that isn't emotional, but it's very emotional. I'm told to run from here to there. I know that I'm going to die at a certain point. Does it get any simpler than that? But once you engage, it was like practicing a death. And when I see it, I do get a chill. I remember very well the first time I was nominated for an Academy Award. I didn't even know when they were announcing nominations. My son's babysitter called me up. Hey, guess what? You've been nominated for an Academy Award. Hey, can I go with you? No. I move faster alone. I remember. 
We're bringing God and man together. They'll never be together unless I die. Last temptation of Christ, there was a long search to find Jesus. <laughs> and I wasn't involved in any of that. <laughs> Almost every actor I knew at one point went in on this movie, but I wasn't part of that. I was teaching and I got a call. Hey, Martin Scorsese wants to talk to you. Really? So of course I went to New York and said, absolutely, I'd love to do it. He said, let's do it. When you're being crucified, this flood of emotion comes to you, a flood of association comes to you. It's a very powerful thing. That movie had a huge effect on me. And when we were shooting in Morocco, there was nothing else. Modern life felt a million miles away. I had no idea it would be controversial. Its intention seemed so pure. It was exploring something that had to do with spirituality. I didn't anticipate the problems that happened. I think that was a particular time politically that the religious right needed an issue to kind of circle their troops around, and that became it. It is accomplished. When did you talk to Lula? Uh, I talked to her this afternoon. When you was out. Wild at Heart was a great experience because that role kind of did itself. David Lynch, like, you know, brought out a hanger at one point and said, Willem, this is your costume. And that was it. He also said, we got to get you an appointment with a dentist. And I said, why? I read the script and it said he had bad teeth. But it shows really how actors put limitations on themselves sometimes. I never thought we were gonna do double dentures. I put them in my mouth and I couldn't close my mouth properly. Anybody, go like this. You're gonna feel lascivious and like you're hungry, like you want something and you're gonna fuck with some people. That became a key. Slicked hair, accent, all that comes together. It came out of externals. That was a good role. Here's what happened. I read it in a parked car down the street for the kid to leave. Boondock Saints, Troy Duffy was a first-time director. He was basically a bartender, and he liked movies, and he thought, well, I can make better movies than what I'm saying, so he wrote a script. Getting in through the garage, the kid says he leaves it open when he takes his bike out. And created a bidding war. And then there was a lot of problem with casting. And finally, it went into turnaround, so they had to rethink how they were going to do it. He tracked me down at the theater, watched the theater show that he thought was wacky. <laughs> I don't think he made head nor tails about it, but he was a sport. I just liked the, the fact that he was a self-starter and this was such a passion project for him. Yeah, it was a gamble. It was a very much anticipated, and then it had a fall from grace. It got a very minor distribution, but against all business models, it got popular. It became a cult movie. I can tell just by how people come up to me on the street. It's usually a very male audience, but not always, of a certain age. If they come up to me, I know it's going to be a Boondock Saints person. It's going to be a guy that wants to talk about Detective Smecker, which was a really fun character to play. Boondock Saints has a special place in my heart. For some people, they think it's trashy, but the people that love it, love it so dearly. Today I want the Boston police to do my thinking for me. I will have a f***ing tag on my toe. Now give me a squad car and get me over there. Don't think I can't harm you. Tell me how you would harm me. And even I don't know how I could harm myself. Shadow of the Vampire, second time I got nominated. I play a vampire that's based on the actor in Nosferatu. I could watch a film and copy this guy. <laughs> that's where it starts. It was a makeup job that took three hours to get in, three hours to get out every day. It was a complete package that took me away from myself in a very concrete way. And whenever that happens, you connect with a kind of joy of performing and a joy of finding gestures that wouldn't normally occur to you. You can't wait for inspiration. You gotta do something, and then it's really through action that stuff happens. Make him wish he were dead. Yes. And then grant his wish. But how? 
The cunning warrior attacks neither body nor mind. Tell me how! Spider-Man. I wanted to do it very badly. It was competitive. I remember I was making a movie in Spain and they flew a casting director to do a screen test in my hotel room. That's how I got the role. I had to fight for that role. My friends were like, really? You're gonna make a cartoon movie? Some of them snobbed it, you know? But I thought, no, this will be cool. This is interesting. Movies from comics were not a normal thing. It felt like something new. And then you had Sam Raimi. He knew this material and he loved this material. And it was a double role. We were doing a lot of wire work. That stuff for me is fun. It's like being a circus performer. When are they gonna make a circus movie? I'm ready. Don't you know me and Esteban always thought of you as our baby brother? I've always thought of you two as my dads. Please don't let anyone make fun of me for saying so. I can't guarantee that, Klausy, but I'll try. I've worked with Wes Anderson four times now. Life Aquatic was the first time. It's different each time. Don't imagine that Wes Anderson works just one way. There were these master shots, very long, and he'd just fold parts of the ensemble in. So I was on the set all the time, and it would be like, hey, Willem, do you want to be in this shot? <laughs> Sometimes we'd work all day on one shot, rehearsing it, and then we'd shoot at the end of the day, and Sometimes we do it in two takes. It felt like theater. When I say I don't normally do comedy, I find out I do comedy after. <laughs> you know, you play the scenes, you, you live in the world. I can say in retrospect, that's comedy. We're being led on an illegal suicide mission by a selfish maniac. I hear what you're saying, but I think you misjudge the guy. The literature that you used in your research was about evil things committed against women, but you read it as proof of the evil of women? Antichrist, I love that film. It speaks the unspeakable. It gets play for some of its extreme violence and some of its kinkiness, but there's a lot more besides that in the movie. Lars, every day is a trial. Every day is shocking. Every day is interesting. When you work on a movie that, that is heavy or, or is dark, sometimes it would haunt you and sometimes it would just be so much that you'd be able to entertain some gallows humor and have a good time. Chaos reigns. You got your power back? And use your TVs, VCRs, AC, what have you. Have a nice day. I love you too. Florida Project, I was interested in Sean Baker. He's very pure. He knows how to do this thing that I love so much, and that is work with what's there. Working with people that aren't normally actors or new actors was thrilling. He created a world, and they were just existing in that world. They weren't thinking about acting. I could be not an actor. I could be a hotel manager. There were people living very similar lives to the story that we were making. Those people that were living in that situation told us how to make that movie. So when you work on a movie, sometimes you're working with a guy that was a cook last week. You're working with a woman that's maybe a model, a woman that's been doing Shakespeare for 30 years. Everybody has a different way to get there, and I like that. At Eternity's Gate, beautiful role. Julian's a friend. I've also been with him in the studio. I see him paint. He had a very particular way to tell this story that I knew wouldn't be a bullshit biopic. It would be an imagining of who we thought Vincent van Gogh might be. And there are lots of sequences of me painting. There's no stunt painter. I would have to learn how to paint. And Julian taught me so much, not just about painting, but about how to see things. I felt very alive making that movie. Lad with eyes bright as a lady. Come to this rock, play in the tough. You make me laugh with your false grum. The lighthouse. Wow. 
<laughs> Rob Eggers, I saw The Witch. I knew nothing about it. I thought, wow, there's a filmmaker here. Something about how he made that world and didn't make it a period film that points at itself. You really were able to enter that world. I sought out Rob Eggers. We tried to do a few things that didn't quite happen. And then one day he said, I, I, I've got it. You and Rob Pattinson, more or less, yes or no. It was a very direct approach. And I said, absolutely. It's not often that in a film you get to perform with elevated language. That's an interesting challenge to have. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Help me to recollect. Second. Go, you you said Formosa, what is that? What's Formosa? You said working for Formosa, what does that mean? No, Jesus, I said they're all working for Moses, Moses Randolph. I knew Edward Norton, we're both New Yorkers. He was in pre-production, it was quite late. When he first asked me, I said, I can't do this movie. I was growing the beard for Lighthouse, and I said, no one had a beard in the 1950s. And because I'm growing the beard for this other thing, I won't feel committed enough. I won't feel cleansed. The next day he called up and said, no, I don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> and I liked his persistence, so I said, okay, let's do it. And in the end, I surprised myself. The beard helps because it really does set the character apart in a way that's very useful in the storytelling. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? I'm hungry. You can buy me dinner. I try not to live in the past, and I try not to think too much about the future. Call me a hippie. What can I say? Be here now, baby. You learn your lessons intuitively. You refine things. And you uh, work towards a personal liberation. What is it? The Ah, I thought you said... The Love Bus. I thought, was I in a movie called The Love Bus? <laughs> um, <laughs> not a bad title. <laughs>